and welcome back to Book and Page. We are still working through Percy Jackson, The Lightning Thief by Rick Riordan. And today we are actually on chapters 15 and 16. So as always, we'll talk what happened in those chapters first and then talk a little more deeply about that stuff. So chapter 15, the campers arrive in Denver. And the very first thing Annabeth suggests is getting in contact with Chiron back at Camp Half-Blood and letting him know what's up. They do this by finding an empty car wash. It turns out Irish, Irish messaging is a thing. You can send a message through a rainbow and basically get vis visual contact and audio contact with whoever you're trying to call. They go ahead and do this, but actually get Luke at Camp Half-Blood rather than Chiron. Apparently something's going on at camp and Chiron is busy. When Annabeth and Grover leave to deal with an obnoxious driver who comes in, Percy is left to talk with Luke. War is coming. Yay. After this, now officially out of money, the kids stop at a diner. They're trying to convince the waitress to give them food anyways, when they are interrupted by a biker arriving who terrifies everybody and seems to hypnotize them. Probably because it turns out that biker is actually Ares, god of war. What you gonna do? Now, Ares is here to talk with Percy mainly. Try and see if he can convince him to do him a favor, which is to go and collect his shield which he left at a local water park when he and his girlfriend were interrupted. Percy's emotions are out of whack because Ares is here affecting them, and eventually they decide they'll go ahead and head to the water park. They break in, Grover quite easily, Annabeth and Percy having to jump a fence with barbed wire on it, and find the Tunnel of Love. Unfortunately though, it turns out as they're walking through this, we get a brief history about the relationship of Ares, Aphrodite, and Hephaestus. A.K.A. Hephaestus and Aphrodite are married, but Ares and Aphrodite are seeing each other behind Hephaestus' back, and he constantly tries to catch them at it. Turns out he's still doing that because Percy and Annabeth spring the trap that is the Tunnel of Love right when they get a hold of Ares' shield. This sets off a bunch of cameras, some netting to keep them there, and a bunch of mechanical spiders, which Annabeth is not okay with, and they only escape because Grover turns the water on, Percy floods the ride, and pilots the boat out, and they only escape alive because Annabeth actually can do the math to know when to jump. I mean, all of that still got streamed to Olympus, but hey, they got the shield. Chapter 16, they return to the diner to find Ares waiting and return to him the shield. Percy still wants to punch the dude in the face and is only really held back by Annabeth and Grover, who are doing their best to be polite despite the fact that they're probably equally as mad as Ares, at Ares as Percy is. Ares gives them some clean clothes, points them towards their transportation. That is a zoo transport truck that doesn't take care of their animals. Yes, inside is a zebra, an albino lion, and a gazelle of some sort, all of which are looking atrocious. So the kids do attempt to help them for as much as they can do with the plans of breaking the animals out when they get the chance. This comes the very next day, but they do chat a little bit before they head to bed. These chats are quite important. We actually have some honesty in the truck, which is to say that Percy is honest about what Luke spoke about on their chat, their Iris chat leading Grover to be honest about his involvement in Thalia's death. And we get most of the actual story, in which Annabeth also defends Grover, as does Percy. 
We also get some honesty between Annabeth and Percy as well, which is to say Annabeth explains she's not good with spiders, Percy already actually knows the story behind that one, Arachnid, and ultimately asks Annabeth where she'll side, noting that Luke said that Athena's cabin had sided with Zeus. Annabeth admits she would side with Percy because they are now friends. The next day, they successfully break all three animals out of the truck, when they really do find proof that even the drivers are absolute assholes. So, animal breakout time. Percy also realizes he can hear the zebra, probably because of his father's affinity with horses, because Poseidon made horses. Zebra, apparently close enough. Grover also gives them a satyr's protection to guarantee that they'll find safety, shelter, and food until they can find a home. And they skip the truck as well. Wandering around Vegas, they end up in a hotel, the Lotus Hotel and Casino, where they are trapped for five whole days without realizing it because it's just so amazing and look at all these games and oh my goodness. Percy thankfully saves them though upon realizing that everybody here is from different years and nobody seems to have aged at all. So he helps them escape and they're just like, well, got one more day to finish this quest. Perfect. Perfect. So a lot happening here. Overall, very interesting. And this is one of the critical reasons why rereading is always worth it. I had not realized how undercutting in that conversation Luke is being. Like he precisely drops hints to try and destabilize the three campers who are out in this investigation. Like it's just like, you'd have to be invisible to get the lightning bolt, knowing that Annabeth has the hand of invisibility. And then he's just like, oh, but I didn't mean Annabeth. <laughs> Death protests too much. And then him yelling right at the end, like, tell Grover it's fine. No one will turn into a pine tree this time. Why? Why did he even bring that up? It's that destabilization factor again. And it sort of then becomes a question, as you realize that Luke is kind of undercutting everybody here and like verifying that Percy is still wearing the shoes, that you wonder how re reliable of a source of information is he. Because the other information we get in this conversation is that war has spilled over into the camps, into the camp, single camp, into the camp, and the cabins are taking sides. And he precisely puts Athena on Zeus's side. And you're kind of standing there like, Did you do that on purpose? Did you precisely put sort of the the cabin of the other demigod on this quest on the opposite side in this battle happening? Because altogether It seems like a strange thing to have wind up in in the order that he did, where he talks about like Apollo, Aphrodite, and Ares all being on the side of Poseidon and then putting Athena over with Zeus. And I am trying to think of the Trojan War and the setup of the gods on that one because That's, again, what Ryordan points to. He has Percy point to the, the Trojan War. Is this going to be another Trojan War where my dad and your mom are going to be on different sides? And 
trying to take a look at it, it's kind of weird overall that this gets mentioned at the moment it does. By Luke, I mean. It makes sense within the story because we're upping the stakes. For the most part, it's been smaller little adventures, which is completely normal for a Greek epic about a, a journey. Like, this is full-on Odyssey at this point, um, which is really cemented by the Lotus Hotel. And the Lotus Eaters are a moment in the Odyssey where, like, you eat the lotuses and then you're trippy and happy and don't want to leave. And Odysseus loses crew members uh, to the Lotus Eaters. So we are on full-on Odyssey style of journey, which is to say that they keep stumbling into these monsters and these events um, and dealing with them as they arrive, which is full-on Odyssey. The Iliad, though, is different because the Iliad is precisely a war novel. It's not a journey novel. So attempting to combine both the Iliad and the Odyssey is, is sort of interesting. Because the format, for sure, with our campers is the, the quest, the journey. But all around it, then, is, is the war happening. Or you're led to believe that this is true. Because Luke saying that there's a war happening at camp and then bringing up the Trojan War doesn't then seem to gel with the fact that Ares and Aphrodite are out on a date and Hephaestus is up to just his old normal tendency to try and catch them. Like that doesn't feel like all of the gods at war with each other. And we can't draw parallels to the Trojan War too closely. Because Zeus isn't really on anybody's side in that war. Like, he has a tendency to interfere on both sides. And in fact, in order to interfere, like Zeus at one point says, okay, no more interference. And in order to interfere, <laughs> Hera seduces Zeus and then has him put to sleep so that the gods can go all out during the Trojan War. So the fact that Zeus is like an active member of this war, we aren't looking at the Trojan War again. So constantly drawing parallels to that, we have to be very careful about that. And it's just, it's really funny having the Odyssey and the Iliad brought up so much in this set of chapters. Like, the, the Lotus Hotel is a really direct parallel to the Lotus Eaters, done in a different way, done in a way that's going to seem much more attractive to a younger audience in modern day than just the ability to trip out and sleep for thousands of years. Which you have to keep in mind would seem really attractive to people who had just been at war for just 10 years. Like, the Trojan War takes 10 years. So, Oblivion on that one is really attractive. But what's actually happening here is a different type of war. And it's a war far more amongst the gods than it is amongst the demigods. Like, the Trojan War is this weird intermix, but the fact that Zeus tells the gods to stop interfering at one point, is Zeus is making the war not about the gods. It's about the humans involved. Which is to say that Paris picked Aphrodite as the most beautiful goddess. She, in getting that title, rewarded him with the most beautiful woman, who was married to somebody else. And Paris and Helen having fallen in love, thanks to Aphrodite, Paris steals Helen away from her husband, and we all go to war. 
So you could see where the gods are the beginning of it, but for the most part, the battle uh, and the war is amongst the humans. Like the husband didn't look around and be like, oh, oh, Aphrodite did that? <laughs> nope, not getting involved, not touching that. Goddess made her decision, that's over there. No, there is a human aspect to this war uh, that is happening which then we get a lot of the gods then fighting for their preferred sides but not because they're necessarily like choosing one side or the other. Hera and Athena it's questionable whether they're choosing one side or another because those were the other two goddesses in the competition for the most beautiful goddess that Paris snubbed but sort of everybody else it's more just like well which side honored me more which side has more of my kids on it because there are demigods sprinkled throughout the trojan war and i'm not talking low demigods uh, achilles is actually a low demigod his mother is a goddess but she's like the daughter of the sea god like and not poseidon i'm talking about like oceanus so she's kind of lower tier so achilles is technically like a lower tier demigod unlike the percy jackson series in which we're dealing with a bunch of high tier demigods um the direct children of the olympians so like Achilles is like a low tier demigod, but there are high tier demigods involved in this war, uh, including ones that literally like their god parents are snatching them up right before they die. And again, this is another reference we get, which is Ares confirming that Percy's mother isn't dead. She was pulled away and held by one of the gods. Now he points towards hostages at this point, which Sally Jackson really is. But we see this more in literally gods saving their kids right before death, where they're just like, nope, 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 nope. Like, Aphrodite does this. She does it even with Paris, because Paris is her, her favorite, because he chose her. Zeus does this and gets told off by um, Hera for it. You said we weren't supposed to interfere, and now you're interfering. And it gets to the point where they actually have sort of this strange moment where a couple of them need to let their kids die because of this. And you're just kind of like, God. So we're, we're getting a lot of moments of the Iliad and the Odyssey coming through and then a direct denial that this is what's happening on the part of Ares. So Ares comes into the diner, sits down, and says, I heard you broke Clarice's spear. And Percy's like, she deserved it. And Ares goes, yeah, probably. I don't fight my kids' battles. And you're just kind of like, Because all the references to the Iliad should be pointing out that that's not always true. Like, that is deeply not true when it comes to a lot of these gods. Where they are getting involved in human lives because they're related to them. Or because they're favorites. And this is true even in the Odyssey. So Odysseus is not a child of Athena, but he is a favorite of Athena. Uh, precisely because he fights wars using his head. He's a really intellectual um, warrior on that one. Which is just Athena all over the place. So Athena is constantly like guiding Odysseus and guiding Odysseus' family because he is a favorite of hers. And like I said, the Iliad is full of moments of the gods interfering for 
the humans, not just because of any disagreement on their part, but because of their relationship to these humans. So you're kind of like, oh, you don't fight your kids' battles. Then why did you bring it up? Like, I think there was supposed to be some in intimidation there, just mentioning it. And just, wrong demigod. Like, if it had been anybody else, they might have been like, so, sorry Lord Hades, like, sorry Lord Aries, I'm very sorry, I didn't mean to, it was an accident. And Percy's just like, fight me! But it's actually then really frustrating in the reverse. Which is to say, Ares comes in and says, I don't fight my kids' battles. But we've already been told in this text, so we don't even have to go into the Iliad and the Odyssey, but in this text, that the gods have a tendency to use their kids to fight their battles. Which is, the gods disagree with each other and use their children to undercut each other, to steal from each other, is what's being implied here. And ultimately to fight their battles, which is what's being pointed to in Luke saying that the fighting has started at camp. Like, the gods are just watching this video of these three kids on the, the love ride on Olympus, just laugh, laid back and laughing about it. And evidently Camp Half-Blood is up in arms. Because the gods are a lot more willing to use the humans to get what they want. And then sometimes will turn around and return the favor. They just seem to be far more open about using the demigods than fighting for them. Like, they're, they're more willing to deny that, um, like Ares does directly here. I don't fight my kids' battles, and it's kind of like... But you use your kid to fight yours? Which he does immediately. He makes the statement, I don't fight my kids' battles, also go fight my battle for me. Like, go get my shield and return it to me because Hephaestus outflanked me. Like, Hephaestus did defeat Ares in this moment. They got out before everything went wrong, but Ares left behind his shield. And just go back to last week's video to, to view why the return of that shield then is so important. And, and why Ares is willing to use other people to fight his battles on that one. As he will like directly deny that he fights any other person's battles. It's <laughs> just like, oh, oh, mixed standards here, dude. Mixed standards. But that's, that's the gods. They are in the powerful position. So allowing other people to help them is a gift from the gods. And it's a better gift for the humans than just fighting their battles for them. It might then seem weird, the, the two sections we get after um, Percy and Annabeth and Grover retrieving the shield, which is to say the release of the animals and the Lotus Hotel. But the, the trajectory here actually makes perfect sense in understanding our human heroes and us picking their sides. Which is to say that this whole adventure for Ares, in which he was defeated by Hephaestus, that is just, it seems petty to us. Keeping in mind, of course, that you can't judge God characters by the human moral compass. But it's really hard for us not to do it, and it's why mythology uses so many human characters to do the gods' bidding. Because we can better understand them, uh, and better judge their actions, rather than being able to judge the actions of the gods. But that entire adventure seems petty. Our heroes' lives were in danger purely because they were in the wrong trap. 
It was just meant to embarrass and humiliate a couple of gods. It wasn't a big thing. The gods of Olympus were just laughing at it. Like, well, aren't we at war? So then having sort of the slowdown moment with the animals in the truck is actually critical because in this moment we see our demigods choose to use their own power to help others. Which is to say that these two kids are like gods to these animals. They have a powerful position that they can use to their advantage. And it's a direct parallel because uh, the, the truck drivers mentioned that the zebra is going to a magic show. Well, isn't the god sitting there laughing at this tunnel of love escapade the same as us laughing at a zebra in a magic show? Or in a zoo. Or in a circus. There is some connection there. So the fact that all three of these kids go into this truck and independent of each other decide to help as much as they can and help free these animals. There's not one person, Grover's not sitting there badgering these people, like Percy and Annabeth to help free these animals. Like, no, all of them see how atrocious these animals are being treated and decide to help as much as they can, including freeing them when it means they actually lose their ride to LA. They do it anyways, because these animals are suffering and they have the power to stop that suffering. And in this moment, we choose the kids over the gods. Because first and foremost, we can judge these people based on a human scale. And somehow, 12-year-olds are kinder than thousand-year-old gods. And that speaks to us. These people, as children, are trying to be better than their parents and the, and the gods and the adults. Like Percy notes that Ares reminds him of every bully he ever faced, kid or adult, every teacher that laughed at him. He's trying to be better. He's trying to help creatures that need his help because they can't help themselves. So the truck scene is precisely to show that these kids are going to do better than their parents did. And they're going to endeavor to do better in a way that shows kindness and compassion and caring rather than just breaking things. So then you might be wondering what I mean about the Lotus Hotel scene being placed perfectly. Well, this is actually the mega temptation these kids have to face. And it might seem like it comes at a weird time because they're not at a low here. They're not at a defeated low, I mean. They did just successfully get Ares' shield back for him. They successfully freed these animals. Victories, they're actually at a high, but for the realization of how unfair the world is, these kids are at a low. Which is to say that the gods are always going to punch down. And to be socially responsible as demigods and mortals, they can't punch down. They can't take their frustrations out on people and animals that are weaker than them. They need to help those people, even if the gods aren't helping them. And this is true for modern day, for social media, and trying to deal with all the injustices of the world. Because not caring, not getting angry, not getting involved, it's socially irresponsible. But there's just so much to get angry and involved about. It's utterly exhausting. and overwhelming and just 
there's too much to do for just a single person, how are we supposed to fight against it all? And that's, that's what these kids must be feeling right now. How are you supposed to fight against the gods and against other humans and a world that just doesn't seem to care most of the time? And that's when the Lotus Hotel shows up. And suddenly these kids have an option to just not care. To just forget about it all and let the world go to hell in a handbasket. Well, they just stay in the hotel. And that temptation creeps up on them without them even realizing it's a temptation. Like, they get so sucked in that they spend five days in the Lotus Hotel before they realize it. But that's because... That's the temptation of oblivion. The Lotus Eaters were originally very tempting because the crew that went to them were war veterans of ten years who wanted nothing more than to forget everything. And that's true of these kids too. But the Lotus Hotel is insidious because part of that is self-care. Taking time for yourself, stepping away from the world, and just doing something to unwind, that's necessary. You will drive yourself into the ground if you don't do that. But the important thing is not to stay there. It's to recharge the batteries and then come back swinging. But that's really hard. Especially if you feel so insignificant, like you're never going to make any actual difference. That's the temptation of the Lotus Hotel here. Why shouldn't I stay and play video games? There are so many people out in the world who have more power, more strength, more money, more understanding, more knowledge, who could do such a better job. Why is it my responsibility? I'm just a little kid. So, I think that's hard for a lot of us. The Lotus Hotel is attractive for a lot of different reasons. The lack of responsibility being the main one. So the fact that Percy, Annabeth, and Grover can walk out. I think that's something we need to strive for. The ability to recover ourselves, to take care of ourselves, and to come back and keep fighting for a world that needs us, even if it doesn't always seem that way. Man, the lessons you can learn from children's books, eh? Well, I'm going to keep reading, and I hope you do too. So I'll see you next time.